I was getting some stuff ready for uh, Children's Church tomorrow morning, and, and the, we're looking at the Noah's Ark over this weekend, and, and uh, I saw this one cute thing. Uh, uh, this pastor was in front of the kids and said, okay, um, so what do you know about Noah's Ark? And the kids are like, well, there's all these animals there. And uh, it's like, oh, how are they supposed to get the animals? Well, we're supposed to gather them and bring them in. And, and like, why are they going on the ark? Um, what, what's, what's, why, why is this guy doing that? And, and one of the kids says, so, so that he can put them on the cross. <laughs> it's like, well, no, that, that just, that's just a little bit later there. So uh, sometimes we, we know these stories and we think we've got them down and, and there's parts of them that we think we know but are not quite really there. Uh, when we come to the Noah's Ark and the Ark narrative, uh, it's very familiar. I'm sure you've heard it many times in your life, and, and you probably told the story to, to younger children, and, and probably many of you have had Noah's Ark uh, decorations in your kids' bedrooms at some point, or, or maybe in your own bedroom. Maybe you still do. I don't know. Um, but there's all this familiarity with it, and, and uh, you know, some people will look at the story and think, well, these are some of the things that, that are there that well, actually aren't in the text. Uh, John Walton in his, in his commentary brings out three of them. Uh, a lot of people think that, that uh, it took Noah and his sons 120 years to build the ark. Um, but nothing at all says that. Uh, 120 years comes from uh, a, a, a verse in chapter 6 of Genesis, but it does not say that it took them 120 years to build it. It doesn't say how long it took them to build it. Um, also, many people think that, that Noah was preaching to his neighbor during this time to get them to repent and well, there's really no description of Noah doing that in this story. And then a lot of people think part of the story is that Noah and his sons were ridiculed by people, and they thought they was you're crazy, what are you doing? And they would not accept his invitations. They have this image of, of Noah, just come on, come on, get on with this. Well, but there's none of that in the text. And, and so um, it could have happened. It's possible, but uh, we just we don't have those things as as part of it. In fact, what we have in terms of real interactions by the people in the story is is very little. Uh, the action in all of this is is what God has begun and done in the midst of the story. So so, so what do we say about the story? Again, it's one of the most familiar stories in our culture. Um, all these things, and we look at Noah, it's like, yeah, Noah, you're great. And, and it talks about Noah being righteous and blameless before the Lord, that he walked with the Lord, and these are pretty high-level things. Um, but this is far from your children's bedtime story. Uh, the, the dynamics of this story are really quite horrible. Uh, you've seen at some point probably uh, videos of tsunamis coming and, and wiping out cities and islands and different places, uh, the devastation that natural things happen, er, uh, earthquakes and those kind of things. And, and uh, this story speaks of things that are worse than even that. Um, historically, there's, there's evidence of, of flood both in literature and in geology. These are things that, that are, are talked about from way back when, and, and there's certainly lots of questions that get raised in the story. Now, was this a global flood, or, or was it a regional thing, or was it localized? Uh, I mean, the, the text certainly points as you re read the text, and we'll look at big portions of it tonight, uh, about complete destruction. So we take that in, but, but it seems that... As we look at it, it's really not interested in giving us those kind of details. Uh, in similar ways to when we looked at the creation story, the details of how all these things happened, precisely how long things happened uh, in, in, in each particular day, it doesn't give those kind of descriptions because there's other things that the, the story being relayed is interested in. And at the, at the core of that is, is the presence of God and the things that are going on. Uh, well, last week we, we took a look at uh, the first eight verses of, of chapter 6 and, and just noted the, the tension it gives to the wickedness that was on the earth. Um, and as we t look at this today, I want to start in, in chapter 6, and, and we'll recover some of that in verse 5. But the first section here will be uh, Genesis 6, 5 to 6, 22. And it says, The Lord saw... 
how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. That's uh, 450 feet long and, and um, 75 cubi- uh, feet wide and, and then uh, 45 feet high. Uh, make, a, make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to, be taken, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So as we get in this story, we're seeing obviously there is a problem as God looks at the world. And it comes in this repeated uh, description of it was corrupt, it was violent, there was wickedness that was there. And, and as God looked at it, you, he is saying, enough is enough. And, and I'm going to wipe out everything, but I'm going to save your family, Noah, and your remnants. And, and so he directs him to build this ark. And um, some people have noted that the dimensions of the ark are actually a, a, a pretty seaworthy vehicle just in terms of, of its length and its width and, and the, the way that it's described how it's to be made. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is a good ship. Um, there are other stories that come along this line that are... are well, in, in one of them, I think it's the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the, the ship they're supposed to make is a cube, which is a very strange thing. It was not going to be very seaworthy. But I, as we come to, to the biblical description of it, it is, the ark is, is, is a very seaworthy vessel. But again, as, as, as the indictment comes, it comes upon all of creation. Uh, there you almost have a reversal of Genesis chapter 1. In fact, it, even in the, the ordering of how things are described, the birds and every kind of animal and creature, and as well as mankind, and that which rolls or uh, creeps along the ground, th- there is this, this, this taking from the, the Genesis story in chapter 1, the creation story, and now in the, the ark story, there is this, I'm getting rid of all of this. It's, it's a complete eradication of what has happened, except for Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Eight people will be saved, as well as um, all the animals that will be part of this. Uh, Noah is the one who has found favor in God's eyes, and he will preserve a sampling of creation and set about saving them. Uh, some will be saved, and, and through that... Uh, creation will be salvaged. I do know what salvaging is. It's you take what you can with what you have and, and, and make do with it. And, and so earth is going to be changed radically because of this event, but it will be salvaged. Uh, there is a sense that there is an end to this because if there wasn't, why, would, why put him on a boat in the first place? If he was just going to destroy it completely, 
then, then why save Noah as well? Um, but in the saving of a remnant of mankind, those who are created in the image of God, but also all creation, the birds and the, 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 the creatures that crawl and, and the, the livestock and all that, why save them if it's all going to be gone? So even in this, this condemnation, there's a sense of, of a new start that's going to come and, and going to happen again. But sin, judgment, then the sentence is there. This is what I'm going to do. So Noah, this is what I want you to do. Notice Noah doesn't say one word in this. <laughs> All he does, he's, uh, the, the, the best thing he does, it says in verse 22, and Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Well, as the story goes on then in um, he gets all the animals. They, they begin coming on. And, and I want to jump to, to chapter 7, verses seven, verse 17 to 24. Um, the water comes. The Lord shuts the people in and, and the animals in. And then to verse 17, for 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Uh, every living creature that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and, with, and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. The waters come. God said it was going to happen, told him to build the boats. He builds the boats. They get in and the waters come and... and and then the waters flood the earth for 150 days, uh, uh, just about five months. Um, and this is destruction. This is, this is horrible. Uh, all the worst pictures of, of devastation we've seen don't match this. Um, and there they are. But the story moves on. Uh, chapter 8, it says in verse 1, but God remembered Noah. But God remembered Noah. Uh, there's something to take from that. But let's look at the rest of the story as it goes. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The mountains continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent down a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water over the, all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the, dark, in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground, and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ground, one kind after another. Wow. Wow. Wind comes over the earth and starts blowing things around and starts drying things up. And, and as we had the creation and then the reversal of creation, 
now we have the recreation happening again, that there's life is emerging on, on the land again, and all the creatures are being put there. And, and almost a year, they've been in this almost a year. Uh, in, in chapter 6, it talks about on the seventh, uh, seventh day of the second month, uh, now to the 27th of the second month of the following year, uh, they are in the, in the ark and they're released. That's a long time to be in there. Now, there's all kinds of details when you look at this. You're thinking, what, how did all this work? How is this possible? You know, there's animals there. They need to eat. They need to do the other side of eating. What do we do with all that stuff? How does that take? You know how much the text tells us about that? Nothing. It doesn't give us that, those, those details. Because, again, what is it interested in? The dyna- dynamics that are happening there between Noah and mankind and, and what God is doing. And in the midst of this flood, we have this this verse in in chapter 8, verse 1, but God remembers. God remembers that they're there. He doesn't forget them. Uh, That may seem like a a throwaway verse, like, well, how could he forget? He's God, right? But that God remembers and knows that they're there is a statement of, of his care and his attentiveness to what's going on. I mean, it sits in the pattern that we've seen in other places, that, 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 that God has direction and plan, and he has ordered. Things have become chaotic. Uh, you can imagine that much water rushing up and filling uh, all that's, that they can see is going to have just catastrophic things. It's going to be, well, just like the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the, the earth uh, was was. Uh, tohu we bohu, uh, formless and void, and there was waters over the earth. That's how chapter 1 of Genesis says, and now it's that way again. There's all, this water is over everything. But God begins to bring back order to this from the chaos. And with that includes this remembrance he has. God knows where they're at. Well, so they, get, they come and they get out of the, they get out of the boat. Um, and the story goes on, uh, starting in verse 20 of chapter 8. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I cr- curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky and every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for that, your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will all the the, the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. 
So we come now into the land, and Noah's first inclination is to build something to remember God. He puts an altar there, and he, and he sacrifices some of the clean animals that were there and, and dedicates that to the Lord. And, and there is this interesting interplay, and, and it's happening throughout this entire story. And it's the, this usage of the word heart. Uh, maybe you noticed it in, in chapter 6 at the beginning there where, where it talked about how God's heart was, was deeply distressed or vexed, uh, it says in some other languages or other versions. Um, God's heart is there, and as he looks at win, w- wickedness in the world, as he looks at this, this mankind and, and creation that he's made and sees it being abused and misused and, and the image of God being tainted and, and dis- disregarded, it vexes him, distresses his heart. God has a heart. And it is deeply affected by what's going on there. Uh, there's another description of hearts, and that's the heart of mankind. This is said twice in this, in this particular narrative, and it's not a great statement. Uh, I mentioned it last week. The inclination of man's heart is what? It's not good. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the phrasing says that uh, the, the, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was evil on, only all the time. When they get to the other side of that, all of the mankind except for Noah's family is destroyed, but still the indictment on mankind is every inclination in his heart is evil from childhood. But now, on the other side of this, God's heart is moved from the altar, uh, this, this sacrifice that, that Noah brings to the Lord and says, never will I do this again. I will never do this again. I, there, there is this, this sense in the, as we look at the story of, of things that keep coming out through scriptures, of, of mankind's sinfulness against God and, and his anger with it. Sin angers God, but there's with this this care and heart for mankind and desire to, to be reunited. And uh, in, in the prophets, there is the prophet Hosea. And God uses Hosea as, a, as a, a picture for all the people. He tells Hosea to marry a faithless woman, a woman who is unfaithful to her husband. She is a prostitute. And, and uh, they get married and they have some children. And their children have very un, unsavory names. Uh, as again, as, as models for what the people are doing. They, they are, are, are hurting other people and, and are not following God. And, and eventually, Hosea's wife leaves her. And, and it's a picture for how the people of God have left God. But then God says to Hosea, go buy her back. She sold herself into slavery. Buy her back. And the picture there is God says, I'm saying to my people, I will come get you back. I will do all I need to to bring you back to me. God's heart is for his people that they would know and, and follow him. Uh, God loves us and wants to have relationship with us, to know us, and calls us back to himself. Uh, this is the beautiful side of this horrible story is that sin makes a difference and we see the prevalence of sin in this story, but uh, we can still see this today. Uh, again, we discussed this at some length last week. Sin's pervasiveness, its insidiousness, it, it has a grip even on us. And whether that's materialism or pride or other things which are, are guiding us, uh, Jeremiah says of this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? These are not good descriptions of mankind. But God loves us and wants us to know him. And, and despite the sin in our life, provides ways for us to come back. In Noah's story, he says, I'm never doing this again. And he sets up the rainbow. Um, now, the picture of the rainbow, we, you know, we look at the rainbow, and, and it, it has various meanings to us. But when we see one, it's beautiful. And, uh, but well, there's a violent image to a rainbow. Um, because it's a bow. What do you do with a bow? Those of you who hunt uh, know that you use a bow to shoot an arrow. And when the rainbow is up there, in which direction is it facing? 
It's facing towards God. Uh, God uses these kinds of images when he makes covenants in other places as well. Uh, there's this description of, if I fail to keep my covenant, may, this, may I be shot at or killed. Uh, this is the elements of, of covenants that are described there. The, the stipulations, if you fail to do that, are, are harmful. And, and God sets the bow there so that when he sees it, he remembers, I will never do that again. Because his heart is with his creation. Uh, this is part of the story again as well. He created mankind in his image. Described again, even in this passage, that there's so much value he places on us and that the way we treat one another, that matters because we are image bearers of God. And so finding ways to treat one another with dignity and care and love is an essential part of this. Uh, he talks about here that to shed the, the, the blood of a human to kill them is, is, is the worst they can get. Even animals will be accountable to this because it is to harm this image bearer of God. That's the care and love he has for us. And so uh, for us as we live our lives, facing sin in our lives and realizing there's, there's things in our lives that we might need to, to, to get out of our lives, to repent, to move away from entirely, but that we can always go back to the God who remembers. He remembers us. That's an amazing phrase. I, I, as I think about that, I just think of moving responses in the, in the dynamics of human relationships. Someone does something, then, and, and the response is, you remembered it could be a birthday, it could be an anniversary of a special event, but, but that someone remembered you and this particular thing in your life. Well, that's what God, God remembers you and knows you. And as we come back to him, having stumbled and walked away, he wants to welcome us back. So the story is a hard story because it's this destruction of so much but there's also this picture of hope that uh, for Noah, who is blameless and righteous before God, which, by the way, does not mean that he's sinless, but that, is not, that he's not pursuing a life that, that walks away from God. And when he sins, he gets himself right with God. That's what being blameless is. And that's what he wants from us. To turn back to him, to walk with him, to love him, and the way that he loved us. This finds its fullest expression in the work that Jesus did on our behalf. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by the grace that comes through the work of Jesus Christ, who became an atoning sacrifice for us. Jesus died to make things right for us with God. He took the penalty of sin so that we could be right with him. This is the God who loves you and is calling you to remember that he remembers you and that you matter to him. Have you come to him? Are there things you need to get back to right? Don't be afraid to come back. Come back to him because you matter. The work of Jesus is all about you and you knowing him. And you living a life on this earth connected to the God who created you, but also a life that will come on the other side of death, that which is everlasting. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father, we, uh, as we come to this story and, and just uh, look at it, uh, maybe as adults instead of kids and, and see it's, it's not as happy and fun as, as uh, it seems when we were kids. Uh, yet, in the midst of a world of wickedness and harm and violence, corruption, um, you as a holy God cannot abide those things. And, 
And so there's, there is a consequence. And yet within this too is a willingness to, to relent, to help those who, who will come back to you. You have remembered us. You've remembered us in so many steps along the way in scriptures and, and finding its, its biggest peace in Jesus. Thank you for that love, Lord. Thank you that you loved us so much that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us and that we can walk our days here in these, in these bodies with you, but we can also walk in the, the life to come because you have rescued us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love. And thank you that you remember us. And we pray all this in the name and power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. God bless you this night. Mm-hmm.